Hello, welcome to Art History Continuums. My name is Deanna Georgeson. In this continuum, we're going to examine the connections between still life artworks through history. Welcome to the Still Life Art History Continuum. This presentation begins by comparing four different Baroque still life painting styles. Zerberan from Spain, Dahin from Flanders, Steenwick from the Netherlands, and Chardon from France. These are followed by the post-impressionist painter Cezanne, who influenced the modern artist Matisse. Next, we look at the American abstract expressionist Richard Diebenkorn, and finally, the postmodern German artist Gerhard Richter. Introduction to Still Life Painting History Still life painting can be found in classical Greek and Roman art, but it was considered a secondary subject compared to the portrayal of mythical gods and heroes. By 1300, starting with Giotto and his pupils in Italy, still life painting was revived in the form of fictional niches on religious wall paintings which depicted everyday objects in a realistic style called trompe l'oeil, to fool the eye. Throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance in Europe, still life painting remained primarily an adjunct to Christian religious subjects and conveyed religious and allegorical moral meanings to viewers. Patrons believed that historical and religious narrative scenes that included figures were the highest form of art. This hierarchy changed during the European Baroque period from approximately 1600 to 1750. The seriousness that had been reserved for the high art subjects of religious and historical events shifted due to an emerging middle class who were profiting from commercial imports from foreign countries. During the Baroque period, artists could focus on still lifes and landscapes because there was an emerging market for paintings of these subjects. The new middle class, or bourgeoisie, had a taste for common genre scenes and still lifes money to invest, and a desire to surround themselves with beautiful objects and collectibles. The first Baroque painting that we're looking at is by Zerberan, called Lemons, Oranges, and Rose, from 1633. Zerberan bridges the transition from historical religious subjects to more common everyday still life scenes. Most of his commissions came from the Roman Catholic Church, so he painted many portraits of saints as well as still lifes, but they all had a religious purpose. To the devout Catholics in the 17th century, the apparently humble objects represented here have significant religious meaning. The measured placement of three motifs was an allusion to the Holy Trinity. Like the classical still life, this painting depicts the physical character of the objects and the shallow space they inhabit, revealing the rough textural skin in great detail. The weight of the volumes is revealed through chiaroscuro, a gradual light to dark modeling of the tones. The rhythmical arrangement of the light and dark shapes of the leaves across the top is a typical formal compositional device used during the Baroque period to create a sense of drama and movement for the viewer's eye. To follow. Baroque paintings like Zerberan's were seeking to stimulate the viewer's senses by using religious symbols. The second Baroque painting that we're looking at now is by Jean Dehin, called A Table of Desserts from 1640. This large scale painting, approximately 74 by 80 inches, exemplifies a prompt a type of Dutch Baroque still life painting that represents an ostentatious display of luxury items imported from exotic places. Against a backdrop of lavish fabrics and Turkish carpets, we see precise, accurate renderings of gleaming surfaces and reflections in ornate silver platters, precious metal vessels, and delicate glassware. The patrons who commissioned these paintings made no secret of their expensive tastes. The artist's objective was to record social, historical, and economic conditions and make a statement about how prosperous the Dutch merchants were 
by showing off their worldly possessions. The third Baroque slide that we're looking at now is by Steenwick called A Vanitas Still Life from 1640. This painting was done at the same time as Dehem's painting, but serves a different purpose. This vanitas is an allegory of human vanities. And the objects are meant to show the viewer the transience of human life and the ultimate futility of all human endeavors. The skull refers to death, while the other objects symbolize knowledge, pleasure, power, and wealth. The beam of light draws the viewer's attention to the human skull at the center of the arrangement. The final Baroque painting that we're going to look at in this presentation is by Chardin, called Still Life with Glass Flask and Fruit, from 1750, a lot later in the Baroque period. Chardin recorded the simple lifestyle of the Parisian bourgeoisie without sentimentality. The intimate, domestic focus of Chardin's still lives contrasts sharply with the subjects of the high art, heroic, romanticized historical and religious scenes. His unsentimental still lives were at odds with the predominant lightheartedness of the French Rococo period. The French Sun King, Louis XV, who commissioned interior designs in the Rococo style, granted Chardin a studio and living quarters in the Louvre. Chardin's still life paintings were exhibited in the Paris salons or exhibition halls from 1737 to 1761, and his work was admired by critics and the public. He worked very slowly, carefully balancing the formal elements in his compositions, and only created about four paintings per year. The use of soft, diffused light creates muted tones in these still lifes. Chardin contrasted thick brush strokes, called impasto, with thin, luminous glazes to create realistic textures in the objects he was representing. The next painting we're looking at is by Cézanne, called The Blue Vase, from 1890, which is a post-impressionist period of art history. Cézanne used common, everyday objects because he wanted to focus his attention on modulating color and shape harmonies between objects and the space surrounding them. He structurally ordered whatever he perceived into simple foot planes. The background space in this painting is constructed by a clever interplay of vertical and horizontal lines which contain evenly distributed volumes. This painting is by Matisse called Still Life After Dehem or La Desert from 1915, which is the modern period of art. Matisse admired the Baroque paintings of Chardin and Dehem, which he studied when he visited the Louvre in Paris and made small copies of their work when he was an art student. This still life is a version of Dehem's composition, but is based on what Matisse called the methods of modern construction, influenced by Cézanne and Cubism. Matisse is quoted as saying, in modern art, it is undoubtedly to Cézanne that I owe the most. Matisse laid out the composition in a grid-like pattern and invented abstract images within each area. Along with many other modern artists, Matisse was primarily concerned with the formal composition or arrangement of lines, shapes, colors, textures, and spatial relationships. Matisse was not attempting to paint a naturalistic representation of what he observed. He wanted to paint his emotional reaction to the world, not the world. Matisse, Matisse's advice to painters was, seek the strongest color effect possible. The content is of no importance. 
This is an example of Matisse's painting in an exhibition. Notice the large scale of the painting, similar to the size of Dehaene's original painting that inspired Matisse. This painting is now part of the Museum of Modern Arts collection in New York City. This slide shows a painting by Richard Diebenkorn called Still Life with Orange Peel from 1955. This colorful painting by the American artist Diebenkorn, who studied abstract expressionism painting at the University of New Mexico and moved to Berkeley, California in 1955 to teach painting. Diebenkorn became an important figurative painter in a style that bridged between Matisse and abstract expressionism. He belonged to an influential group of California artists called the Bay Area Figurative Painters, who did not completely abstract their paintings like many other avant-garde American artists did during the 1960s. By 1965, Diebenkorn traveled to Russia to study the paintings of Matisse in galleries there. The final slide that we're looking at is a painting by Gerhard Richter called Still Light Vanitas. It's part of a series called Skull with Candle from 1983. Gerhard is a postmodern painter. Many compositions that he paints are based on photographs he takes in his studio. Postmodern painters are usually inspired by previous art historical periods. Richter produces abstract and photorealistic works at the same time. He has an anti ideological attitude towards painting that undermines the concept of artists maintaining a single, cohesive style. This painting by Richter belongs to a series called Candles and Skulls that were inspired by the Baroque Vanitas still life tradition, where symbols are used as a reminder of the inevitability of death. However, unlike the traditional Baroque Vanitas paintings, Richter removes many of the earthly symbols and shows us simply the light from a candle shining on the human skull. He has reinterpreted a classical theme for our contemporary age.